Welcome to the Mind Channel. Each short video of this series covers a single key area of building information systems. This is not the popular learn by having fun entertainment. The episodes are short and dense. Please prepare for a deep dive. Today's topics are knowledge and thinking. The following concepts will be necessary to understand the more technical episodes. Although thinking is a fundamental human activity, we experience practical limits. We use tools from handwritten notes to the internet to overcome them. Just like transportation. Although we can walk, run or carry objects, we have created vehicles, roads, traffic signs and rules, and so on. New generations of the transportation ecosystem enabled activities that were not only impossible, but unimaginable before. Of course, these achievements come at a price. Some are direct, like accidents, the cost of fuel, or building and fixing roads. Hidden costs range from resources and waste of vehicle production, local and remote pollution, to favoring distant, cheap mass manufacturing instead of local production. Informatics today is a global ecosystem to improve the amount of knowledge and our abilities to access, use and manage it. Just like in transportation, it is important to minimize risks and avoid adverse side effects. We must understand the original challenges and separate them from the problems that appeared while we solved them. The ancient Greek philosopher Plato used an image to explain the process of thinking. It's like sitting in a cave with a fire in the middle, facing the wall and watching the shadows. Thinkers can only use this partial bias projection to understand, derive consequences and interact with the reality. This picture is quite hard to accept, let alone embrace. It is tempting to discard it because it's dated or too abstract. So let's take a current version. A British statistician, George Box said, all models are wrong, some are useful. Scientific thinking starts with a sufficiently precise terminology and rules. We use them to make measurements, find relations and so on, to model the reality. Finally, we build and control things based on these models. For example, vehicles are based on mechanics, gas and fluid dynamics, etc. We don't care that we can only statistically model the chaotic behavior of the air molecules. Or gravity is not even a force, as long as it acts like that. We even use opposite models to describe the same thing. Light is an electromagnetic wave here, a stream of photons there. But if Doppler radars and solar panels work as expected, we are good. Plato continues his story, listing the hardships of thinkers who free themselves from those chains. Thousands of years later, research showed the inherent limits of the thinking process. Kurt Gödel showed that any sufficiently complex system contains contradictions. Cannot be true. Noam Chomsky created a formal connection between textual knowledge and its scientific formalization. Alan Turing showed that even his automation of the thinking process will not help. Any process in a complex system may run forever, and you don't know which one unless you wait forever. Apart from theoretical barriers, thinkers must deal with much closer practical problems. Knowledge is valuable only when applied properly in a live situation to select and execute the beneficial action. Our communities gathered knowledge over centuries. It is impossible for any individual to own all of it. So we must use physical objects to store and procedures to transfer. Thus, the real value of knowledge depends on our storage and communication infrastructure. Some of the related limitations are obvious. Think of the speed and reliability of a message carried by a pigeon. Or the difference between having a library or working with people who had read and discussed all the books. Others are more subtle. How well do you know the language of the book? Or the meaning of the words at the time it was written? Or even the notation systems like mathematical operators, numbers and formulation rules? For people 
We may say that a hundred kilometers distance meant that they lived in different worlds. They never knew about or affected each other in any way. The early 20th century broke these barriers and created a fundamentally new environment. The Chains novel by Frigyes Korinti explained how at most six friendship links can connect any two random persons on the planet. H.G. Wells thought that this would allow humanity to create a global brain, share knowledge and resources for common benefit. They were motivated by the experience of the First World War, but it did not prevent the Second, and even today it seems to be far, far away. The powerful knowledge management infrastructure has personal and social side effects as well. Until this point, most people had extremely limited amount of knowledge, mostly from personal experience. They used it in their neighborhood, that also supplied immediate feedback and validation. Myths and organized religion filled most of the gaps, also gave social behavioral templates. They motivated cooperation, emphasized personal responsibility for higher entities or ethical values. The age of reason around the 18th century in Western Europe created public education. Schools distributed general knowledge beyond the minimal needs. They also replaced the church with the state and faith with abstract philosophical concepts. Today, informatics changes partially replaces formal education as the primary source of knowledge. But schools and teachers also provided social patterns among peers and with power structures. They were not perfect, but at least trained and organized. Furthermore, the conscious evaluated building process of knowledge disappeared. This blurs the gap between knowing something about and understanding, let alone mastering an area. Neil Postman detailed the possible consequences and predicted our presence in his books Amusing Ourselves to Death, Public Discourse in the Age of Show Business, 1985, Technopoly, The Surrender of Culture to Technology, 1992, or Building a Bridge to the 18th Century, How the Past Can Improve Our Future, 1999. The knowledge accumulated in global information systems grew over decades. We need quick computer programs, artificial agents to find the relevant subset to use in our tasks. Simple searches still supply too much information, seemingly endless lists. We need some sort of interaction, a gradual conversation to narrow down to the important segment. Beyond the people, these agents can also use other information sources like measurements, internal models as well. In 1950, Alan Turing warned that we need a precise definition of the terms machine and thinking beyond the common sense. He showed that otherwise, as those agents will be able to imitate any human trait over time, they can appear to us as infinitely smart super people. Eliza, the first chatbot using simple linguistic rules and a small vocabulary confirmed his theoretical proof in 1967. Many people testing it asked for private conversation after a brief period, regardless of knowing what it was. Quoting its creator, Joseph Weizenbaum, I had not realized that an extremely short exposure to a relatively simple computer program could induce powerful delusional thinking in quite normal people. Today, the largest companies use the whole internet as input, train gigantic language models to find the most human-like next word. Then they apply human sensors to further trim the answers and present these conversation agents to the public. These agents fulfill the predictions, but do not address the true challenges of knowledge management. That requires a fundamentally different approach, following the initial goals of informatics. This is the end of this episode. If you are interested in more details, you will find references and links to related videos in the description. Thank you for your attention.